Today I'm going to be reading from Jung's Red Book for Our Time, Searching for Soul Under Postmodern Conditions by Murray Stein and Thomas Arst, Editors, Volume 3. So today I'm going to read an essay by Dr. Paul Brucha, The Creative Power of the Soul, a central testimony of Jung's Red Book by Paul Brucha. One may well ask, is it worthwhile to study the Red Book in detail? If so, why? After all, we know that the substance of this document has been absorbed into Jung's later theoretical works and is more easily accessible in this later form. Is the Red Book of importance only or mainly to bibliographically interested academics who want to follow the lines of development from this work to the later writings and try to show the hidden references to Red Book material in other of the author's thoughts. In response to this, I would say, the vital psychological interest of the Red Book lies in the fact that here we encounter the searching and creative Jung. In this work, Jung takes an attitude towards the reality of the soul that is also valuable for psychologists today and for people of the 21st century in general. It manifests a relationship with the soul that values it as a living reality, sui generis. It shows a way of dealing with it that brings it alive, as it were, in its original primal state as a mysterious and extremely powerful reality. The Red Book does not offer a theory of soul, a psychology, but something much more fundamental. It offers an experience of soul, an existential testimony of an encounter with the soul. While writings about the soul can easily turn into theoretical studies about the psychological phenomenon that could be studied, examined, and explained, the Red Book puts the reality of the soul as such at the center of attention. Jung realized in his Red Book how much he had fallen into a zeitgeist inspired surface perspective. The Red Book is an experiential book documenting Jung's handling of the autonomous reality of his soul. It bears witness to his individual story and his personal experiences but the attitudes taken by him are of more general validity. They emphasize the soul as an autonomous creative force and show the conditions under which it can unfold in its own autonomy. We can also understand the Red Book as an empirical representation of soul's creativity under specific conditions. Soul creativity is different from creativity in science, technology, medicine, economics, politics, and sports. It is a creativity that plays in the medium of imagination and visual perception, is based on subjectivity and personal experiences, creates symbolic signification and meaning, includes feelings and the unconscious, and aims at expression and creative design. It is akin to the creativity in art and poetry, where individuals create and shape symbolic reality on the basis of inner experience and through an exchange with the unconscious. In the following, I wish to consider some of the conditions for experiencing the soul in its autonomous existence as they become evident in the Red Book. The zeitgeist and the hero as impediments to the soul. At the outset, the Red Book draws attention to two mental attitudes that stand in the way of the soul's creativity. The one is a spirit of this time, a zeitgeist, which is opposed to the spirit of the depths. Jung describes this zeitgeist as the dominant way of thinking that determines how people think and behave in a particular epoch. The zeitgeist of his time is characterized by a complacent reason 
that sees itself as an absolutely autonomous and sovereign guiding principle, which does not want to submit to any ideas suggested by the soul. The spirit of this time considers itself extremely clever. The zeitgeist considers dreams as foolish and ungainly, and itself as filled with ripe thoughts. It considers itself superior due to its developed logical discursive thinking. It faces simple visual thinking with condescending disdain. This thinking in the mode of the zeitgeist is dominant, anticipatory, abstract, and self-confident. It is thinking in the style of scientifically methodological knowledge or absolutized directed thinking, as Jung says in his book Symbols of Transformation. It is a type of thinking that often appears in fairy tales as the archetypal tapas of arrogant and know-it-all older siblings in contrast to the instinctive knowledge of the simpleton. Jung's Red Book emphasizes that a certain mental attitude stands in the way of true, soul-inspired creativity. This includes a critically depreciative and dogmatically biased state of mind. Soul creativity requires openness to the spirit of the depths, namely a sense for the pictorial, intuitive, and childlike, playful element in the psyche. Quote, you think that the dream is foolish and ungainly. What is beautiful? What is ungainly? What is clever? What is foolish? The spirit of this time is your measure but the spirit of the depths surpasses it at both ends. Only the spirit of this time knows the difference between large and small, but this difference is invalid like the spirit which recognizes it." Unquote. This spirit also has a problematic relation to time. It knows only linear progress, the forward movement. It is incapable of dwelling in the here and now. Quote, the spirit of this time has condemned us to haste. You have no more futurity and no more past if you serve the spirit of this time. We need the life of eternity. We bear the future and the past in the depths. The future is old and the past is young. Unquote. Under the cipher of the zeitgeist, Jung thus characterizes an uncreative attitude that is detrimental to the experience of the reality of soul. He does not mean a certain specific time period or epoch, rather he means the zeitgeist of all times, an attitude that in the name of what is ajour and corresponds to collective consensus negates the opposite, the spirit of the depths which nourishes itself from the unconscious that transcends all times. The spirit characterized as zeitgeist is a spirit that runs counter to all creativity and experience of the soul. It is a spirit that can interfere with both creative activities and therapies of contemporary people. It prevents, for example, analysands from descending from the high horse of intellectual reasoning to engage with dreams, to paint pictures, and to allow feelings of grief and helplessness. Often a zeitgeist dominates that misunderstands therapy as quasi-medical treatment in accordance with the collective consciousness. There is then no willingness to entrust oneself to the spirit of the depths and to engage in an inner process under the leadership of the unconscious. The attitude of the hero is the other attitude that stands in the way of creative activity and experience of soul according to the Red Book. On the one hand, this consists of pursuing high performance goals with the object of achieving something perfect and ideal. In this perfectionist quest for something higher and better, the imperfect is suppressed as if it had no right to exist. Such a one-sided strategy of perfection, which excludes the conditional opposite, 
contradicts the dynamics of a creative antithesis in psychic reality. Quote, the heroic in you is the fact that you are ruled by the thought that this or that is good, that this or that performance is indispensable, this or that cause is objectionable, this or that goal must be attained in headlong striving work, this or that pleasure should be ruthlessly repressed at all costs. Consequently, you sin against incapacity, but incapacity exists. No one should deny it, find fault with it, or shout it down." Unquote. The other soul-destroying component of the hero consists in the fact that this attitude leads to non-authentic imitation. This becomes apparent in two ways. On the one hand, one follows outwardly set ideals. On the other hand, one gains role model status for others and seduces them into apish imitation. This runs counter to the fact that everyone is called to creative self-experience for themselves. The Red Book declares, quote, Imitation was a way of life when men still needed the heroic prototype. The monkey's manner is a way of life for monkeys and for man as long as he is like a monkey. But the time will come when a piece of that apishness will fall away from men. Then there will no longer be a hero and no one can imitate him. The hero must fall for the sake of our redemption since he is the model and demands imitation. If you are in yourself, you become aware of your incapacity. You will see how little capable you are of imitating the heroes and of being a hero yourself. So you will also no longer force others to become heroes." Unquote. To what extent is a heroic attitude counterproductive to an existentially creative experience? It implies a shift from the honest effort of self-development from within to mere imitation of an ideal set from the outside. Instead of choosing one's individual reality with its possibilities and limits as the true place of self-formation, one chooses a high goal outside. Instead of completeness, one strives for perfection. Instead of authenticity, one seeks for exclusivity. Instead of being creative from within oneself, one aims for the unreachable ideal. Jung recognizes in the heroic tendency, with its incapacitating and self-alienating approach, a great danger to a real inner experience. This can be seen again in the context of today's analyses. People who are bonded to a particular ideal have difficulty really getting involved in a fruitful analytical experience. These are people who, for instance, are trapped in unquestioned religious beliefs as to how to lead a godly life, or people who cling fanatically to political ideals and socio-critical conviction that rob them of openness to other positions and their own shadow aspects. In a creative process, an overly ambitious attitude moves from the immediate here and now and the unplanned and fortuitous to becoming a faraway goal difficult to obtain. In such a case, the work cannot develop itself out of itself. It is steered in advance to a predetermined result. This reduces its creative quality, because then the creative process cannot generate freely the unexpected new, the real symbol, the recognition of the soul's creativity in its antagonism. According to the elementary basic experience documented by Jung in the Red Book, soul in its innermost essence is a reality determined by opposites. Insofar as opposites mean energy and are the starting point of creative endeavors, the soul characterized by opposites is a living, energetic, and creative reality. The image of soul drawn by Jung in the Red Book is very new in the history of psychology and is still unique today. 
He sees soul as an autonomous reality that lives from inner opposites. The special feature of this conception is that the opposition is not only seen as that between different psychic components, for example, between consciousness and the unconscious, between ego and self, between the individual and the collective, between present and past, although these entities are not excluded as causes for inner conflicts, but also as an inherent autochthonous antagonism of the soul in its very nature. This is an antagonism that does not arise from different claims from inside and outside and between different inner voices in the sense of the usual psychic conflicts, but from the very core of the creative soul itself. It is an actual process of birth initiated by the soul itself in which division and distinction serve transformation and creative production of a new third. Since it is an amazingly autonomous and sublime event, Jung symbolically speaks of a divine child. With this term, he describes the origin of this antagonism as a transcendent, i.e. extraordinarily effective creative power. Quote, the divine child approached me out of the terrible ambiguity, the hateful beautiful, the evil good, the laughable serious, the sick healthy, the inhuman human, and the ungodly godly." Unquote. Jung represents the antithetical quality of the psychic reality also with the image of the serpent. With this image, he describes a dialectical dynamic within opposing poles that corresponds both to life and to the essence of soul and creativity. Quote, the way of life writhes with the serpent from right to left and from left to right, from thinking to pleasure and from pleasure to thinking. Thus the serpent is an adversary and a symbol of enmity but also a wise bridge that connects right and left through longing much needed by our life." Unquote. This describes an antithesis that is peculiar to all creative individuals. This is an antithesis between Dionysian sensuality and Apollonian depth of thought, which is not only described in Hermann Hesse's Narcissus and Goldmund, or by Friedrich Nietzsche or C.G. Jung, but belongs to the reality of the creative par excellence. However, the antithetical quality of psychic and creative reality does not only consist in the ambiguity of opposite aspects or of dialectics between opposing poles, as we have seen, but it also includes the connection between opposites. Quote, I saw a new god a child who subdued daemons in his hand. The god holds the separate principles in his power. He unites them. The god develops through the union of the principles in me. He is their union." Unquote. Jung recognizes a powerful, autonomously creative principle in himself. A new god, a child, that subdues the daemons in his hands, i.e., that reconciles diverging opposite tendencies through creative activity. The God develops through the union of the principles in me. He is their union. This means that the union of opposites creates the sublime reality of a superordinate, transcendent, symbolic reality, allowing God to develop inside man. Finally, Jung addresses the theme of opposites in connection with the contrast between man and woman. Is the soul female or is it male? The position of the Red Book is, quote, You can hardly say of your soul what sex it is, but if you pay close attention, you will see that the most masculine man has a feminine soul and the most feminine woman has a masculine soul, unquote. 
Jung points to the fact that the soul not only contains opposites within itself, but that it stands in contrast to the conscious person. It is thus not only ambivalent, paradoxical, and transcends opposites, but it also behaves in a compensatory way to the conscious mind. In summary, it can be said that the soul in the sense of the Red Book is essentially determined by the aspect of polarity. It is therefore seen as a living energy, as an independent counterpart to consciousness, and as an autonomous capability for transformation. Creative action and expression also must be determined by opposites if they are to be more than merely an intellectual endeavor, but spring from the imaginative reality of soul itself. Through opposites, the soul expresses itself in its amazing liveliness and dialectic nature. When, however, creative expression is too uniform, obvious, and rational, it becomes a matter of intentional production and intellectual manufacture, of kitsch and propaganda. Such works are boring because they are one-dimensional, too obvious and deliberate, and because they lack the liveliness of psychic polarity. Recognition of the soul as an autonomous reality. In his inner experience, Jung is led to recognize the soul as an autonomous reality. First of all, this implies a double reversal of the previous view anchored in his own ego. On the one hand, he learns that all life goals and relationships are about something beyond the achievements of concrete, self-set goals, namely the fundamental search for one's own soul. On the other hand, he must realize that he is not directing his own projects, but that he is guided by the soul and that he is more actor than author. Quote, like a tired wanderer who had sought nothing in the world apart from her, shall I come closer to my soul? I shall learn that my soul finally lies behind everything, and if I cross the world, I am ultimately doing this to find my soul. Even the dearest are themselves not the goal and the end of the love that goes on seeking. They are symbols of their own souls. I had to recognize that I am only the expression and symbol of the soul. In the sense of the spirit of the depths, I am as I am in this visible world a symbol of my soul and I am thoroughly a serf, completely subjugated, utterly obedient. The spirit of the depths taught me to say, I am the servant of a child. Through this dictum, I learn above all the most extreme humility as what I most need. This dictum was repugnant to me, and I hated it, but I had to recognize and accept that my soul is a child and that my God in my soul is a child. Unquote. To be the servant of a child means to be determined by an inner creative principle that shapes one's life in the sense of constant renewal and playful transformation. For the adult ego, which sees itself as a determining force, this subordination to an unpredictably imaginative, childlike soul reality is a big challenge. People with compulsive symptoms show to what an extent the recognition of this childlike divine autonomy of the soul, i.e. the recognition of its powerful transformative energy, can be frightening. They are lacking humility in the sense of the above text. They are not ready to submit themselves to the autonomy of the soul, to its God character, and to recognize its child quality as the organ of change. Psychologically speaking, people plagued by obsessions struggle to assert self-control over the non-ego reality of soul and to keep themselves free of the influence of its childlike ideas and impulses for change. The recognition of the soul as an autonomous reality is mentioned in the Red Book under yet another image, the experience of the desert. Quote, my soul leads me into the desert, into the desert of my own self. 
I did not think that my soul is a desert, a barren, hot desert, dusty and without drink. Why is myself a desert? Have I lived too much outside of myself in men and events? I should also rise up above my thoughts to my own self. My journey goes there, and that is why it leads me away from men and events into solitude." Unquote. The desert experience symbolically means an experience of the total emptying of one's own consciousness. This is intended to create an absolute receptivity toward the soul and its autochthonous ideas. The passage into the inner desert corresponds to a radical loss of conscious thoughts and assured knowledge. This brings about a process of melancholic doubting of all certainties. This skeptical path through the barren, hot, dusty desert questions any skill and established knowledge. These are experienced as merely dry formulas and phrases. What the Red Book describes under the suggestive image of the desert corresponds to the typical experience of an unavoidable loss of a priori certainties whenever new original knowledge begins to emerge. In philosophy, we know this systematic questioning of all certainties. It extends from Descartes, Discourse de la Méthode, to Hegel's Phenomenology of the Spirit, and Husserl's method of the epoche, the negation of all dualities a design. These skeptical approaches each lead to elementary new evidence. In the Red Book, however, the experience of the desert does not lead to a cagato ergo sum, but to an essay on anima, to the vivid experience that the human being is founded in the autonomous imaginative soul. This phenomenon of process imminent experiences of desert-like negativity occurs also in creative processes. These are the moments when the creative individual becomes infested with depressing uncreativity. These moments usually have a final goal. They serve to remove people from their previous skills and knowledge and to make them receptive to radically different and new discoveries, which is suggested by an inner creative counterpart. These are humbling and at the same time absolutely enriching experiences. They give evidence of the fact that ultimately creative imagination does not spring from one's own ability, but from the will of a soul in which a child and a god appear. In the context of analysis, such an existential desert experience can also be observed in the experience of a soul-initiated loss of conscious control for the purpose of recognizing autonomous psychic reality. As we have said, disturbing symptoms can take over this function by showing a two-dominant consciousness the limits of its self-determination. It is forced to admit the autonomy and presence of a different inner reality. The remarkable extinction of former values and faculties so typical of a midlife crisis can also be understood in this sense. It is a matter of inner psychically constellated desert situation in which former strengths and convictions are wiped away. This allows a reversal of perspective that is needed for further life. The essential content of this new view is to realize that one has an autonomous soul and that one is guided by it. The recognition of the autonomy of the soul in the view of the Red Book ultimately means the consciousness of creative depth of the human being. Humans are able to create always new meaning out of the soul. With this symbolizing faculty, they can change the fixed structures of the world. The imaginative power of the soul enables new conceptions and new meanings. This opens up the way of what is to come, namely a perspective of meaning that results from an intuited future and a continually surmounted past. At the same time, life can flow again, 
by flowing in the stream bed of the changing symbolic meanings of things. The symbolic power of the soul recreates anew the established world of created things. Quote, Therefore, whoever considers the event from outside always sees only that it already was and that it is always the same. But whoever looks from inside knows that everything is new. The events that happen are always the same, but the creative depths of man are not always the same. Events signify nothing. They signify only in us. We create the meaning of events. Because of this, we seek in ourselves the meaning of events, so that the way of what is to come becomes apparent and our life can flow again. The meaning of events is the way of salvation that you create. The meaning of events comes from the possibility of life in this world that you create. It is a mastery of this world and the assertion of your soul in this world." Unquote. If we apply the Red Book's conception of the autonomy of the soul as a meaning-creating faculty to analysis, we can say that analysis can also be understood as a creative reinterpretation of life and personality stimulated by the soul of the analysand. In the symbolic vessel of an understanding relationship between analysand and analyst, and with a symbolic understanding of the contents of the unconscious, an interpretive attitude to the analysand's reality takes place. The analysand's life is released from its meaningless factuality and transformed into a suggestive story. This symbolic opening of life from its trivial factuality to a meaningful gestalt has a healing effect. Life is recognized as an expression of a psychically determined event and thus experienced as something more than mere facts. Even if someone has little sense of dreams and symbolic understanding, the contemplative attention to actual life as such is a beneficial creative achievement. It opens a way of salvation, i.e., blind being is transformed into revelation of meaning. Dealing with the archetypal forms of the soul. Quote, but as I became aware of the freedom in my thought world, Salome embraced me, and I thus became a prophet, since I had found pleasure in the primordial beginning, in the forest, and in the wild animals." Unquote. This sentence could be understood as follows. This sentence could be understood as follows. When Jung, on his way to a more immediate experience of soul, had gained freedom from his one-sided theoretical attitude, he could also take a new approach to the reality of his unconscious. He could enter into a personal dialogue with its contents. In this new attitude, he was embraced by Salome, i.e., supported by an inner intuition that made symbolic understanding and expression possible in the sense of the transcendent function. In this way, he became a prophet. This is because new insights became possible through the connection with the living figures of the unconscious and their visual expression, which would not have been possible by pure reflection. The Red Book as a whole is an expression of this prophetic dimension of visual creation. As Jung commented later about his experiences, his inner images became the stuff and material for more than only one life. These images not only anticipated his later personal insights and thus proved to be prophetic in an individual context, but they also laid the groundwork for insights that are universally valid and significant for later times. This prophetic future opening dimension is something that characterizes all true symbolic creation. This is visible, for example, in the precursor function of art, which in all times has given rise to new forms of consciousness and new worldviews in the collective psyche of peoples. Quote, 
for I had found pleasure in the primordial beginning in the forest and in the wild animals, unquote, could mean that he became interested in the primordial archetypal conditions and in the basic factors of the soul. Likewise, he became interested in the forest of the unconscious, the dark background of the psyche. He also turned to the wild animals of the archaic driving forces, the primordial instincts and the psyche of the primitive. In symbolic language and condensed form, the entire horizon of Jung's psychological interests is thus unfolded here in a snapshot. Jung's way of dealing with the unconscious is even more clearly described in the following passage. It describes the method that he will later call active imagination. Quote, I earnestly confronted my devil and behaved with him as with a real person. This I learned in the Mysterium, to take seriously every unknown wanderer who personally inhabits the inner world, since they are real because they are effectual. I must have it out with him, as I cannot expect that he, as an independent personality, would accept my standpoint without further ado." Unquote. The most important thing about active imagination is the idea of taking the unknown wanderer seriously and dealing with it as a real person. In this act of serious and genuine dialogue with the inner figures, Jung shows most clearly his understanding of the soul as real entity. This is his original experience of the soul, his central idea, his most important legacy. Because the Red Book documents this conception of soul so clearly and vividly, it is of great importance. The idea that the inner figures are real because they are effectual is another basic idea in Jung's work. It reveals his understanding of psychic reality in contrast to external reality. In the outer reality, real is what is. In the psychic reality, real is what has an effect. The imagination is real because it has a psychic effect on the human being. With his emphasis on a psychic reality, sui generis, which is defined entirely by the energetic quality of effectiveness, Jung has a conception of soul that is unique and continues to cause incomprehension in the academic world. Nevertheless, it is probably the only empirical evidence in relation to the reality of the soul as it points directly to real manifestations and effects that can be measured. A final thought on active imagination as described in the quotation above. It is about dealing with the inner figures, e.g. the devil, in real terms, as I cannot expect that he, as an independent personality, would accept my standpoint without further ado. What comes along as an ironic remark is meant quite seriously. The point is to take the inner counterpart so seriously that, as with real people, I grant him his own point of view and allow him to understand mine. Active imagination is not mere fantasizing, but a real confrontation between opposing positions and the creative production of a surprising third, a symbol. The concrete examination of the contents of the unconscious, as we have discussed here by following the Red Book, is of great importance for today's analyses. Certainly most of the analytic work with the unconscious takes place in the form of working on dreams during analytic sessions. But if analysands are ready to enter into such an active dialogue through painting or active imagination, they can have several positive experiences. They may experience that an energetic blockage that manifests itself in the form of a physical symptom, headache, tension, back pain, and so forth, or a mental discomfort, grief, emptiness, anxiety, and the like, dissolves into a surprising picture or inner fantasy. It is as if the soul finds expression in a symbol 
and with the symbol various effects come into being that basically belong to the symbolic, the feeding of astounding meaning, even if it does not express itself in an explicit understanding of the symbol, but merely in a foreboding sense of a certain coherence, the wondering consciousness of being in contact with an imaginative unconscious that supplies ideas and participates actively in the formation of images, and finally the invigorating feeling of participating in a creative process that produces something new and unique, existential realization of soul-inspired creativity. The Red Book shows various ways in which soul-inspired creativity permeates and enhances an individual's life. It also shows the conditions for this to happen. A. Existential experience of negativity and blockage. It is an astonishing and irritating aspect of soul creativity that it manifests not only and not primarily as a positive, constructive force, but also as a force of negation and painful dialectical experience. Quote, is there anyone among you who believes he can be spared the way? Can he swindle his way past the pain of Christ? I say, such a one deceives himself to his own detriment. No one can be spared the way of Christ, since this way leads to what is to come. You should all become Christ's." Unquote. Jung does not mean an imitation of Christ, or a conversion to Christianity. What he means is to become Christ in the figurative sense of the crucifying experience, to be at the mercy of insurmountable opposites and to suffer paralyzing powerlessness. The experience of creative people is always to be blocked by adverse obstacles. These can turn out to be so massive that they take on superhuman proportions. But in this Christ quality, they have a redemptive effect. They lead to the way of what is to come, that is, they open a person's consciousness beyond itself by making it experience the limitations of its own creative possibilities. This is the trajectory enforced by the creative power, not to be able to eliminate the paralyzing blocks with a voluntary effort, but to be dependent on a third one. It is about existential humility, which has to acknowledge the dependence on another, a non-ego. B. Experience of meaning and chaos. Soul creativity also feeds on the disordered, the meaningless, and the chaotic, which opposes the orderly world of consciousness. Nietzsche put it thus in his famous poetic thought, quote, one must still have chaos in oneself to be able to give birth to a dancing star, unquote. Jung writes, quote, if you take a step toward your soul, you will at first miss the meaning. You will believe that you have sunk into meaninglessness, into eternal disorder. Nothing will deliver you from disorder and meaninglessness, since this is the other half of the world. To open the gates of the soul to let the dark flood of chaos flow into your order and meaning. If you marry the order to the chaos, you produce the divine child, the supreme meaning beyond meaning and meaninglessness." Unquote. Creativity needs to unfold the experience of the disordered and chaotic in order to create a new order and new meaning. That's why routine and an over-ordered world of proven traditions and matters of course are the death of all creativity. It takes uncertainty, instability, and the experience of the strange. For creative solutions it is well known that in group processes the possibility of uncontrolled brainstorming is needed, where meaningless ideas have space. Also, in the creative endeavor of an individual, 
there is a need for phases of creative aimlessness so that ideas can be born and the creative thought can emerge from the mass of meaningless associations and tentative approaches. Also in analysis, it is important to give room to chaos. Jung writes in General Problems of Psychotherapy, quote, my aim is to bring about a psychic state in which my patient begins to experiment with his own nature, a state of fluidity, change, and growth where nothing is externally fixed and hopelessly petrified." Unquote. The Supreme Meaning or Symbolic Reality Quote, The meaning of events is the way of salvation that you create. The meaning of events comes from the possibility of life in this world that you create. It is the mastery of this world and the assertion of your soul in this world." Unquote. Quote, the meaning of events is the way of salvation that you create. Unquote. This is what Jung will later call religio, the close attention to the meaning of events and the understanding of their symbolic dimension. This symbolic understanding is what allows the soul to live. This is its very specific need, as opposed to the needs of the body and of the cognitive function. Symbolic understanding is the way the soul can prevail and assert itself over and against the mundane world. It does so by creating meanings, by giving a symbolic dimension to things, and by doing so, it redeems itself from the pressures of sheer existence. The captured Jews in the Nazi concentration camp Versenstadt survived by staging all kinds of theatrical and musical performances and by holding lectures on literature, religion, and philosophy in the dead of night. They survived thanks to the meanings that were linguistically conveyed or artistically staged. The fact that the soul lives thanks to meaning-creating expression and is able to survive under restrictive conditions is also evidenced by the paintings of mentally ill people in clinics. People with a diagnosis of cancer are also often able to survive psychologically thanks to artistic expression and occasionally even overcome the cancer somatically thanks to the retroactive effect of the imaginatively revitalized soul. Children also demonstrate that the soul relies essentially on meaning-creating expression. The child translates everything into fantasy reality, which offers an opportunity for play. In the child's view, things are not only what they are made for, they are not only their function, rather they present the subject for a possible staging. The child symbolically converts them into props of an inventive imagination. The purpose of their being, their function, stands in contrast with an antithesis. Quote, to this chair, which is usually intended for sitting on, I assert an antithesis. This chair here on the floor is a horse, and from this I create another meaning. The horse takes a role in an emerging fantasy. Jung continues, quote, This meaning of events is the supreme meaning, that is, not in events, and not in the soul, but is the God standing between events and the soul, the mediator of life, the way, the bridge, and the going across, unquote. The transcending meaning is not in the thing or in events, and not in the soul. It is easy to understand that the transcending meaning is not in the concrete thing or event. After all, meaning does not adhere to the thing, but is attributed to it from somewhere else. But the transcending meaning is not in the soul either. This could mean that it is not simply a matter of an already existing image in the soul, an inner psychic fact analogous to the outer concrete thing. It is much more an ad hoc meaning, God, 
mediating between the things found in the world and the images of the soul. It is a symbolic reality sui generis, the transcending meaning which stands between things and images, world and soul, and transcends both. This symbolic reality is for Jung divine as it were because it is profoundly creative and numinous. It expresses two things on the one hand, a mysterious quality in this symbolic activity and its magical miraculous character, and on the other, the fact that it makes use of the artist and makes him a servant of this power. Considering some further aspects of this transcending meaning, Überschin, it is described as, quote, the mediator of life, the way, the bridge, and the going across, unquote. What could this mean? The creative symbol generating transcending meaning is a mediator of life in that it creates the symbolic world of images and words that emerge between the external world of things and events and the inner world of images. It thereby mediates life, for life means movement within changing forms and the creative production of new forms. Life always wants new birth. This association of creativity and life is more than a literary construction. It has real meaning. People atrophy mentally and physically in an environment that offers no creative space. For instance, Children who grow up in a home where order and cleanliness are more important than playful expression, and where adaptation to given rules and observance of norms counts for more than free self-actuation and self-invention, not only suffer from the suppressed pleasure of self-formation, but also later from serious deficits in self-initiative and from the feeling of meaninglessness and this mental paralysis often causes physical difficulties. Transcendent meaning is also the way in that it lets people experience a continuous narrative process, a coherent story. Symbolic designing does not only produce isolated figures, rather these are closely connected and convey the satisfying feeling of a meaningful process. The Red Book is a good example of the insight that symbolic imagining and creative expression unfold along a coherent path. In this case, as a book, as a work of artistic value, and as a process with different phases. Transcendent meaning is also called a bridge. It is characteristic of symbolic figuration to establish connections between opposing realities and to mediate between a here and a there, to transcend opposites with a third. There has recently been an astonishing example of this bridging function of symbolic reality in the field of politics. North and South Korea, much to the surprise of the world, have recently decided to establish official contact and discuss measures for peaceful rapprochement. This surprising development is generally believed to be due to their joint participation in the Pyeongchang Winter Olympics. These were, in addition to the sporting competitions, a great symbolic staging. Even such a worldly and economy-connected large event can mobilize a bridging spirit typical of symbolic reality. The going across indicates that the symbol leads to another state, it transforms. This is probably its most amazing feature. For example, a person says that painting pictures changes something in him or her. They had a physical and mental discomfort, and after painting this is changed, and the person understands something new or feels different. Here, the act of creating a symbol shows this amazing process of transforming a physical malaise into a new realization. It is as if a physical energetic phenomenon were transformed into a spiritual meaning through the symbolic image. The symbol, in this sense, goes across 
from the physical level where something manifests itself as a disturbance through the level of transformation into a visual expression and finally arriving at spiritual meaning contained in the symbol. It appears that the symbol is this amazing organ of transformation that wants to redeem a person from suffering and lead to new meaning and new understanding. What is astonishing about this is that the symbol has the finalistic orientation toward meaning that it wants to redeem by leading out of the narrowness of being, especially when this narrowness is operative in illness and distress. The symbol is able to realize the going across not only between layers and planes of being, but also as a forward movement from now to later, i.e. not only as a process of transformation, but also as a revolutionary movement toward a new consciousness. Habentibus symbolum facilis as transitus. For those who have the symbol, the passage is easy. The foundation of spiritual creativity in a new image of God. On the path of his inner experiences, Jung finds himself forced to question the collective image of God. He realizes that this no longer meets the requirement of soul's creativity and no longer covers the conditions of life. He therefore feels compelled to develop a new, more adequate and more creative idea of God. That may seem quite presumptuous. Above all, one may get the impression of psychological hubris that quite casually calls into question time-honored notions that have been decisive for many people in many times. But this creation of a new image of God does not spring from an arbitrary act of an arrogant consciousness. Jung is compelled to do so from within. It is the spirit of the depths that demands it. In that sense, one can speak of a true prophetic calling. Why is it so important in the eyes of Jung's inner reality to ask the question of the right image of God and to renew it? This inner voice argues that the image of God largely determines the life of the soul and the possible liveliness or non-liveliness of the human being. Even if the zeitgeist does not attach importance to the question of the image of God and classifies it rather as a negligible private matter, it could still be the case that the modern unbeliever has, in the background of his mind, an image of God that ultimately determines the view of life and the attitude toward it. A conscious or unconscious conception of God ultimately shapes the basic attitude of every human being to their times, to their values, and to life in general. Even atheists have an idea about something most important, supreme, about what is important in life or what is ultimately effective as an agent behind everything. For example, they have the idea that it is important to do good, to be loving, or to be honest and successful, or to be successful, or to enjoy life. In the final analysis, these are all reflections of images of God, and indeed of images of God according to the zeitgeist and to a heroic mentality, namely to exclusively goal-oriented concepts of perfection. Quote, I understood that the God whom we seek in the Absolute was not to be found in absolute beauty, goodness, seriousness, elevation, humanity, or even in godliness, once the God was there." Unquote. There are always ideas aimed at higher goals, i.e. performance-inspired ideas oriented toward a qualitative optimum. For these, something always falls by the wayside. Evil, weaknesses and limitations, the ego with its needs, or conversely, altruism, the sense of other people. There are Calvinistic ideas that have in the past founded a power attitude, 
a dominant behavior toward oneself, toward other people, and toward nature. These are attitudes that have led to repression, one-sidedness in values and actions, and one-sided success thinking. This image of God, which has ultimately promoted the linear, exclusive, upward-striving tendencies of belief in progress, idealism, and ambitious competitiveness, is a profoundly uncreative image of God. It is an image of God that has promoted the adult will and the masculine heroic self-conquest and has suppressed childlike play and the feminine. Jung recognizes in the Red Book how the conception of God, which stands behind the basic attitudes of our society, our time, and our world, has brought us progress in the great developments of technical possibilities, but has caused a massive lack of inner creativity and humanity. The previous one-sided vertical conception of God, which aims at improvements and perfection, promotes progress but not creativity, power but not love, dominance over but not recognition of the weak and limited, negation but not affirmation. Ultimately, such an attitude does not promote life, but is a program of non-life because it sacrifices the duality and changeability inherent to life in favor of abstract one-sidedness. Quote, I understood that the new God would be in the relative. If the God is absolute beauty and goodness, how should he encompass the fullness of life, which is beautiful and hateful, good and evil, laughable and serious, human and inhuman? How can man live in the womb of the God if the Godhead himself attends only to one half of him? Unquote. The new image of God that Jung exposes in the Red Book is determined by opposites that can coexist and complement each other. It is an image of God that integrates opposing qualities in itself. With such an image of God created, the meaning of life can no longer be about striving for an absolute, for self-conquest, for combat and success and dominance. Rather, the challenge is to acknowledge the other, to recognize limits and weaknesses, to play creatively with the contrasting possibilities and perspectives, and to give birth from the endured and affirmed opposites. Then it is not about perfection, but about completeness, and the dynamics are no longer aimed at the pursuit of progress, but toward soul-inspired transformations. I've been reading from an essay entitled The Creative Power of the Soul, a central testimony of Jung's Red Book by Dr. Paul Brucha. Dr. Brucha is Doctor of Philosophy, studied philosophy and theology in Freiburg, Paris, and Innsbruck, 1963 to 1971, and anthropological psychology at the University of Zurich, 1971 to 1975. He earned the Diploma in Analytical Psychology at the C.G. Jung Institute, Zurich, in 1975. He practices as a Jungian analyst in Zurich and functions as a training and supervising analyst at ISAP. And this appears in this book, Jung's Red Book for Our Time, Searching for Soul Under Postmodern Conditions, edited by Murray Stein and Thomas Arst. This is volume three, and as I've said before, this whole series uh, provides many facets, like the facets of a diamond, about Dr. Young's Red Book.
the spirit of this time considers itself extremely clever. <laughs> oh my god. The monkey's manner is a way of... <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> The monk, I am the servant of a child. Through this dictum, I learn above all the most extreme humility as what I most need, as what, and who sail, and who sails, and who sail, and who sails, ugh, I can't say his name, and his, and who sail, and who sells sorry try pronouncing this h-u-s-s-e-r-l apostrophe s okay here we go and who sells and who say the wandering consciousness is being in con <clears throat> i'm not sure which way to uh pronounce this word could be both wondering and wandering, but I'm going to pronounce I'm going to pronounce it wandering. The wandering consciousness of being in contact with the, oh, it must be wondering the captured Jews in the Nazi concentration camp. Theres 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 Okay. Above all, one may get the impression of psychological hubris that quite casually calls into question time on or that sorry sometimes these <clears throat> my I get tongue tied says yes, Christ would be the ideal and the king archetype that contains all. I think he is put into collective mythos so the ego does not identify and grandiose when connecting to the numinous. Uh, Carl says, interesting. Now what if one has the experience that he is Christ and you are and Skip is, etc. I think the story of Jesus is very relatable to the many, hence our compassion for him. Okay, well, that is the objective of Jungian psychology, and it forms the last paragraph in Answer to Job, uh, paragraph 758. Halfway through that paragraph it begins, There then arises that reciprocal action between two relatively autonomous factors which compels us when describing and explaining the processes to present sometimes the one and sometimes the other factor as the acting subject, even when God becomes man. The Christian solution has hitherto avoided this difficulty by recognizing Christ as the one and only God-man. But the indwelling of the Holy Ghost, the third divine person in man, brings about the Christification of many, and the question then arises whether these many are all complete God-men. Such a transformation would lead to insufferable collisions between them, to say nothing of the unavoidable inflation to which the ordinary mortal who is not freed from original sin would instantly succumb. In these circumstances it is well to remind ourselves of St. Paul and his split consciousness. On one side he felt he was the apostle directly called and enlightened by God and, the, and on the other side a sinful man who could not pluck out the thorn in the flesh and rid himself of the satanic angel who plagued him. That is to say, even the enlightened person remains what he is, 
and is never more than his own limited ego before the one who dwells within him, whose form has no knowable boundaries, who encompasses him on all sides, fathomless as the abysms of the earth and vast as the sky. And so, yes, uh, psychotics are unable to distinguish, though. They uh, can't maintain the humility necessary. So um, a psychotic person thinks he's God, or he's Jesus Christ, or he's whatever, uh, but a sane person uh, can distinguish between the two. I guess I, that's the way I would say it uh, for now but we have to maintain our humility. Say, I know how to follow my own Holy Spirit and it benefits me, but I don't want others to suffer, but I could not possibly articulate the ineffable. Um, well, no one can, actually. Uh, I guess my question is, how can we make the Holy Spirit conscious in the collective? I know there are partial problems to the total set of problems for it to happen. Um, I think that Dr. Jung's perspective was that if people individuate, uh, it will become conscious in the collective. And by individuate, that is to understand uh, both sides of our psyche, uh, both the good and the evil, the conscious and the unconscious, etc. The center between all of the pairs of opposites. Martin, that is interesting about art and cancer. When my partner's father passed, he died past, he did a phase of painting. My neighbor is fighting cancer also, and she was painting in her garden a few weeks back. Yum. Um, and uh, the, Dr. Brusha is uh, a long experienced Jungian analyst, so I think he had some good points on that. Sean, I do believe it possible to cause a ripple, not necessarily of the Christian sense of the miraculous word, but a, of the energy that leads one's life. Yes, I think so. It is, and Carl, it is definitely possible to cause a ripple, and I think that is how the world is changed. It all starts in one's soul, surely. Uh, Sean says, painting releases anger better than music. I mean in the aspect of doing the act of it. Music generally, for me, I feel that I'm carrying the absolute picture in my heart. I guess it mean it matters whether you're um, creating your own music or playing someone else's music. And uh, there is a certain strangeness in painting on a blank canvas that relieves the tenderness of the self. Yes. Owen says, we need a Reddit page. Uh, I'll be happy if someone would create a Reddit page. I don't know how to, and I really don't have the time to uh, do that also. I have a few other things that need doing before that, all related to this, but I just want to be able to upvote everything you guys say. <laughs> Thank you. Uh, Carl Andrews, that's interesting. Having no visual artistic talent, I personally feel making music is that way for me, and the visual art is less so. And uh, Carl, Dr. Jung was talking about an image, and so music is an image also. I mean, obviously, uh, Van Cliburn, when he plays without music, has an image of the music that is playing through him, and that's what Dr. Jung was talking about. And in terms of getting in touch with your unconscious and um, sparking a little creativity in your life, uh, I've a few times recommended that you take a choice. You can go to the art store, um, the music store, the uh, 
kitchen supply store, the nursery, or any place else that moves you, and just walk up and down the aisles and see what implements appeal to you. It can even be Sears's um, tool department, and you know if you see a drill press that appeals to you, then maybe that drill press is meant for you, and your soul is telling you something, uh, or you know a lathe or something like that. There are many pieces of equipment that could appeal to you, and if they appeal to you, then you should pursue that. And um, you know somehow I think that. It, even men that buy <laughs> big tractors for the lawn uh, and then they're riding their tractor and cutting their grass that's certainly a creative act and they're carving out a, an image on the lawn I mean that's a start that's I'm being a little facetious but um, whatever it is whether it's paints or clay or uh, any artistic endeavor or a guitar or uh, buying plants from the nursery and planting them and cultivating the garden, all those are creative acts and any of those can get your process starting, started so that you can communicate with your unconscious and um, you know I, have, I started three years ago using the process of creating this channel as my uh, current effort. I've been doing it a long time in other media, for example painting and also writing, and um, in my case this is my creative activity now and I always listen to my soul to tell me what I'm going to present on this channel next and so I think that's the type of thing you need to think about. Carl says, Sean, in the beginning was the Word, the Word was with God, and the Word was God. What you said about the energy that leads one's life, and this makes me think of our lives in reality. And uh, being the dreams of Brahma, what does, does that make sense? Well, certainly words are a symbol uh, that can uh, create energy, and they obviously created energy since the writing of the Bible and so they created Western civilization in that sense but they also lose their effectiveness and when they lose their effectiveness then we need to find something else that's effective as Dr. Jung was saying um, and uh, well, Carl says very nice skip Oh, and thank you, Skip. Looking forward to the next reading. Thank you for your work, Carl. Definitely when I make music, it's because I'm inspired, say, by an anima force, seeing an archetype in an inspiring woman. Absolutely. Women are always inspiring to me. <laughs> Anthony says, love the lathe. Funny you'd mention that out of all the tools, there's nothing better than taking something raw and turning it into something beautiful starts with seeing beauty in the raw. Yes, I agree with that entirely. Carl says definitely skip.